Folks, my name is Nadeem Nakhvi. I'm with the Department of Economics at Kemet University. We have the honor of welcoming today Professor Yu from, uh, most recently from uh, Lanning University, where he's the president of the university. He's also the Boyer Distinguished Professor of Economics at Beijing University, Peking University. And in fact, a PhD from the University of California, Davis in 2005, which is 21 years after I got my PhD. <laughs> so he's a young, uh, vibrant new economist. Uh, Professor Yu has a remarkable paper in the 2015 issue of the Economic Journal on uh, trade processing, uh, tariff reductions, and uh, uh, its implications uh, for, from Chinese firms. It was, in fact, honored as the Distinguished Paper of the Year in 2016. So we are here today to listen to his thoughts on the new, China's new economic thoughts. And those of you who are my students from the international economics class, please try to sketch a model of the Chinese economy and of the world economy that Professor Yu will probably be articulating. So, His Excellency Dr. Deng and this week, uh, distinguished colleagues and uh, students. So, it's my honor to be here. So, thank you so very much. Uh, Chairman's very kind introduction. My name is Miao Jie Yi uh, from uh, Liaoning University. So, uh, as uh, Chairman just mentioned, I indeed I graduated 2005 from UC Davis, and after that, I worked in Hong Kong University for a while, and then I moved to Peking University for more than Decade, so it is 16 years in Peking University. And last year I moved to uh, Leon University as well. So we are really happy with my deputies to come to uh, 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 Kimet this time. Uh, so also let me introduce my colleagues for a while. So we present Mars, uh, who is sitting there. So he's the director of the uh, international, uh, international relationship department and also professor Tristan. Uh, so uh, he's the uh, dean of the uh, China Economy. Uh, China Open Economy uh, Institute, and also uh, Dr. Zhu Yi, also from the same, same institution. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, the two, they two are political scientists and graduated from Russia, from Russia, uh, not, not many years ago. So now, today is really my privilege and also my honor to be here and to introduce you about, uh, about something about the Chinese economy. So please stop me anytime if you have any questions. So, okay, so we say, we understand I mean, the uh, Chinese economy is the second largest economy in the world, following the US, and then particularly if you think about the China GDP uh, last year, it is 121 trillion RMB. And suppose you convert to the US dollar, then will be about 17.2 trillion US dollar. And then accounting for almost 18.5% of the world GDP. So that is the number. And in terms of the foreign trade, China indeed I mean, is the largest trading country in the world. For example, last year, the volume is 6 trillion US dollar. So as some many other countries, we also face some challenge. And particularly, what we say is the aging problem and also the challenge of the deglobalization. But still, I mean, China is able to transfer from the high speed economic growth to the high quality economic growth. And today, I'm trying to borrow this opportunity to introduce you about some new Chinese economy situation. And for example, if you look at, so if you look at, okay, yeah. This map. So basically, you can see that the uh, growth rate of the major economy. For example, according to the IMF prediction, so basically this year the world GDP average growth rate will be 2.9 percent. But in terms of the developing country, uh, the percentage is even higher, 4 percent. So what happened for China? Indeed, 
For the research channel, we obtain the year from the high speed growth to the high quality growth. You see that the speed is pretty remarkable. For example, you can see that this year the prediction is 5.2%. But in terms of the first half year of China's data, indeed, this number was 5.5%. So it's even higher than the prediction. So if you think about, say, the large economy scale, then basically there's only one country can be compatible, and that is indeed 6.1% year. But on the other hand, if you think about, say, where well, China's GDP in terms of the scale is four times larger than India. So put this way, we believe that China is still a major driving force of the world economic growth. So let me start from here. Then we say we have already turned this year from the high speed growth to the high quality growth. And then the question must be, why would you say China's development is high quality? Where is high quality? I will show you some evidence. So I can, I can show the six evidence, say why we believe that China now is in this feature of the high quality growth in terms of the from micro level to the macro level. And from the micro level, basically I will introduce you about the product quality and the export value. And then we will move to the firms talking about the most important things, firms total better productivity. And then we will focus on the industrial level talking about the industrial cluster and also the regional agreement with the region. And finally, we'll go to the whole economy, talking about the economic structure of the nation. So if you have any questions, just call me, then come. And then, now let's move to the first part. For example, think about the quality. So we know quality is very important. And as an economist, the most important way is the how to measure the quality in an appropriate way. So we measure quality in several ways, but that is less important. The important thing is, what's the most important message to take away? For example, if you look at this picture, same year in 2001, when China asset the WTO, year 2001, suppose we normalize this year as one, and then in 2012, the product quality is increased from one to 1.3, so 30% increase. And then say, well, let's take a longer period of time period. See, this is the 2012 here. This is the 2012 here. And if you compare 2012 and now today, you see another 10 years. But then in terms of the unit price, then this increased another about one quarter. So put these two tables or because together, the basic message is that, well, in the last two decades, China's product quality increased more than one quarter, more than 25%, because in the first year, it's 30%, and the next 10 years is one quarter. Yeah, and of course, this is a very, there's a very detailed technique for how to measure the, color, the product quality. For example, you need to think about the demand side, you need to think about the supply side, and then put things together. But there's two details, so let's skip here, so, unless you are very interested. Yeah, so that's the first information that we're trying to Measure. Mention here. And then let's come to the second part. Okay, so the second part comes from the value added. So, value added, China products, value added is also increasing over years. So, for example, let's look at this table first. This table basically measures China's processing trade. What do we mean processing trade? Basically means that you import the firm, import raw material from other countries, and then you have the local assembly in China. And then you export your final product to the rest of the world. So this is what we call the processing chain. And then the key issue of the processing chain is that compared to non-processing chain, or say ordinary chain, the productivity of processing chain indeed is lower, not higher, it's lower. Because basically it says that you don't need your technology. What we need is you take an order from other country and then you use your cheap labor to produce. Yeah, so the basis for it. And then for example, what we say is that we're supposed to look at the proportion. The proportion here is the 50% in terms of the rising size scale. You see that in the 1994 to indeed, I mean year 2001, this is more than 50%. Okay. And maybe perhaps if you look at this is the import, process import. But then you got a value add, you, 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 we look at the process export. I'm sorry, this is Chinese, but this means the process export. 
the basic information is that, for example, this is the 50%. And then this year, 1995, 50%, and to year 2007, more or less, 50%. The message here is that before the financial crisis in 2008, China's possession trade indeed is pretty high, the cost more than 50%. But that was the before. Now what happened? Now, for example, if you look at 2015 and even this year, 2027, last year's data, there is only one third. So the message is that the percentage rate decreased from 50% to one third. Yeah, and another message is that because compared to ordinary trade, percentage rate, they are less productive. Or say, the less productive percentage rate decreased over years. On the other way, say, the Ordinary trade increase over years from uh, 50% to two thirds. So this means China's value add is increasing over years in terms of the uh, time series. And then we can even have uh, this observation in terms of the industry level, the cost session. For example, let's look at this picture. Okay, this shows us the most important category or the industry within the Possession trade. The most important one is different from what we thought. Think about maybe the textile garments. No, it's not textile garments. The most important thing is the machinery here, machinery and electrical equipment. So it's here. And second one, this second one, is the transport equipment, and then following the optical product, and then garments and textile. So what we want to say is that even for the, even within the cost comparison, cost industry comparison, you can see that China's product value add is increasing over years from the traditional test panel in garments to the most advanced, what we call the machinery and transport equipment. Okay, so that is the second evidence. So next is, okay, now we move to the productivity, what we call the total value productivity. And this is very important. As Professor Cookman said, well, productivity is not everything, but in the long run, it's almost everything. So suppose we, we want to see whether this country has growth potential, then the most important way, perhaps, is to look at the firm's total better productivity. If firm's total better productivity is increasing over year, so we can be optimistic with this country's economic potential. So for example, what we see here is that China's PFP, total better productivity, is increasing over years. And precisely, we measure the PFP, I mean, using uh, I mean, bunch of the approach. So this is the work co, co work with, I mean, my co-author Daniel Schaeffler from U University of Toronto, and also his former student, now he's also a faculty member in, U in UBC. So basically, you can see that, well, no matter how you measure China's total data productivity, we are using the cost balance or the change log measure to evaluate the order growth output production function. Doesn't matter the detail, but the point is that it's increasing over years. So that is what happened in the year 2000 to 2006. Also, this table tells us what happened before the financial crisis. And then you must be interested in saying what happened now. Okay, so here it is. So this is information. This is the estimation that we done for the total factor productivity after the financial crisis. For example, uh, we know that financial crisis in 2008, and then we got the data, the one level data up to 2013, so this is one measure. The takeaway information, maybe you can summarize on this table, on these figures. You can see that this one is textile. Number, okay, number one, they are all increasing over time. Number two is textile. And then the second one is the machinery and equipment. Following this one is what we call, is what we call chemical, and the last one is the communication electronic. Okay, yeah, so that is what happened for the data up to 2013. And how about now, more recent years? Okay, here it is. So here it is. <clears throat> so basically, is this left-hand side figures try to compare PFP in China and PFP in the United States. For example, so.
So this is the uh, table uh, I borrowed from uh, my PhD advisor, Professor Robert Fisher at AIH at Mexico. So what we see is that, well, for example, when China assess productivity in 2001 here, China's total data productivity is only 30% to the United States. However, after one more decade, say in year 2015, it's already increased about 50%. Okay, so again, takeaway message is now today, China's total data productivity is 50% of the United States. Well, it doesn't mean that we do not have a competitive advantage on this. As I mean, our professor well, well, must well, well, well deliver in the course. Well, the total benefit productivity is only one point. If you want to think about the competitive advantage, we need to compare the labor cost and also the GDP. Yeah, and because the labor cost here, you know, China's labor cost increase only one six, okay, one six to the United States. For example, uh, our annual salary in Guangdong in, in, in Guangdong province for the labor cost industry with something like 700 US dollars. 700 US dollars, yeah, so it's really cheap. And therefore, there is always a we have a competitive advantage on this. But more or less, the main shift here is that China's TFP is increasing over here. But we do see some challenge here. The challenge is turning on the right hand side, figures here. Because you see, suppose we use the very update data, table table 10.1, to calculate the total data productivity here. Then we see that, well, it seems that this is, this, I mean, this one is for the United States, and this one is for the uh, UK, and here is for China. You can see that the more recent years, China's TFP goes back, is more by time. So there's potential changes. We do realize this, and then we need to think about the way, say how to change the year from high speed growth to the high quality growth. And next. Okay. And let me also tell you my very new research. I think this is interesting to me. So what I want to say is that, well, suppose you look at your cell phone. We understand, everyone understands that the cell phone is a very high quality product if you look at your iPhone, right? So smartphone, there's no doubt. But the point is that this iPhone is produced in China, and indeed, this iPhone itself is done by the low productive difference, like post I mean, the post community is low productive. So here, this is what we call this match. Uh, this is a mismatch paradox between, between the productivity and the quality. Because the usual research, if you look at the United States, if you look at the American firms, usually high productive firm will produce high quality product. But well, this is not exactly the case in China. High quality product indeed, indeed is produced by the low productive difference. And why is that? Well, that is because the existence of the processing firms. What I want to say is that, number one, okay, the iPhone indeed is a capital intensive industry. That's number one. Number two, it's no doubt that iPhone is a high capital, is, is a very high quality product. But because it's produced by the force come, why force come to China? That's because China has have a cheap labor cost. And therefore, which means that this is what we call the processing chain. And therefore, which means that these processing firms, indeed, they are low productive. And that is why we, how to understand and how to interpret the mismatch between the productivity and the quality. And this, this statistic basically just trying to tell you that no matter how you measure your total better productivity, your manuality, your quality, basically processing chain is open, always, I mean, lower productive than the ordinary funds. Yeah, there's observation. Sorry. Yeah. But Look the story is like yeah. Okay. And this is an ongoing so. And then the next part is like talking about these new features of the Chinese economy. I think this, is, this was really important. <coughs> We said we are optimistic on the Chinese economy, and particularly for two reasons, and this is one of the reasons. Because China has a very complete industrial system. For example, if you look at this table, we can see the idea. According to the CIC classification, China's industrial classification, what we call CIC, we got a two digit, three digit, and four digit. Two digit, uh, two digit means it's a broader classification and four means the final one. So we see that we got the 41 broad 
into three, and then a two or seven final into three, and also six hundred sixty-six very is aggregate into three. And then suppose you ask me, say, then, well, how many products that a Chinese firm produce in total? I can tell you about this. Why is that? Finance because if I want to answer the question, I need a very detailed firm level. However, I do not have a very firm level data up to now. But what I have is I can give you a view. Say how many products that China, Chinese firms export. And so the idea is that, well, suppose one product that a Chinese firm export. Then you count one, but it doesn't mean that it's per operation. Then you say it again. So if one product is only sold in domestic, but it's not export. So I cannot tell you how much. So that is why this is a minimum, not a measure. What I want to say is that I tell you how many products that China export, but some products, I mean China do not export, right? Yeah. Okay. So now what's the story here? In terms of the harmonized system A P G. In 2019, before the pandemic, China export more than 10,000 products, 10,000 types of products, 10,000 types of products. And if you go to break, I mean break down in details, so you can see the harmony system to SS2, we got 84, is machinery and also called the nuclear essence, boiler and mechanical appliances, something like that. So 84 and 85, these two chapters are the most important thing. And on the other hand, you can see that Case tile and garments is, is only here, ranking 11 here, ranking 11 here. So, what I want to say is that China now is already coming to an export of high capital intensive product. Okay, that's an important message to take away. So, then another feature. Okay, I like this picture very much. Basically, this picture tells us the industrial cluster. China has many industrial cities. But it doesn't mean that every city will export almost kind of product. Indeed, almost every city, they have their own most important industry. For example, let me show you some cities. Shenzhen, right, is a, a city very close to Hong Kong. Shenzhen, they export the electrical product. And Dongguan, they also export the electrical product and the machinery. Okay, and turning to the northern part, northern part of China, say, Xintai, Xintai in Hebei province, they export, they basically their focus is there, is the Kashmir. And then for the Lamba, they focus on the furniture. Now coming to the Liaoning University, for example, Shenyang here. Uh, so Shenyang, I mean, we got, uh, we got uh, building materials, we, this is the concentration there. Mm -hmm. And then the Inco, for example, we got the magnetic product. And coming home, we have the measuring instrument. So what I want to say is that because this industrial cluster, is able to help them to realize the increasing return to scale, and therefore you are able to reduce your fixed cost. And that is, briefly speaking, one plus one higher than two, not equal to two. So this is what we call the increasing return to scale. Okay, so that's another part. And then, so let me move to, yeah, this part. This is also important. These figures basically tell, tell you what is the proportion for the primary industry, secondary industry, and also service industry? What's the percentage? Some measures are the same as other countries, like the United States, some are not. For example, like many other countries, uh, the primary industry, the percentage here is only 8%. So more or less, it's the same as the United States, and then maybe the UK, and then many other countries as well. But the difference comes from the control of this. You see, the service industry only account for 55%, and which means that the secondary industry is 39%. Compared to the United States, it's different. Because the United States, these guys, I mean the service industry, more than or say close to 80%. And this one, the secondary industry, 12%, because this one is 8%. So 12%. So what is the information behind this operation? Basically, it means that China is still a world factory. It's a new world factory. And indeed, this is important for China because now the Chinese economy, the policy, on the policy, we focus on say, we need promoting the real economy. We need promoting the manufacturing. And why is that? Why China need to focus on the manufacturing or say the secondary industry at this moment? It's not because of the employment concern. Because if you're talking about the employment, well, certainly the service industry is the most important driving force of the employment. Yeah, but the important thing is that 
That is because the innovation, innovation indeed base is based on the manufacturing. And also, if you want to have the firm's total better productivity to increase, you need to you need to rely on the industrial industry. You need to rely on the manufacturing industries. Let's think about I mean the uh, Asia story. So we understand say well some countries they are four in the MIT, which means middle income share. Basic idea is that some country when their GDP is higher than ten thousand US dollar, they are not able to come to the next step. Say twenty thousand US dollar. Why is that? Because those firms they do not have the total better productivity increase, and because of this, the TFP increase the most essential thing. Yeah, for them to realize. But the point is that well, the firms TFP also, I mean, mostly mostly focusing on the manufacturing sectors, but not on the service sector. So that's why I mean, at this stage, China still need to rely on the manufacturing sectors. And then successful in the successful region for something like Korea. Korea uh, is very uh, successful to jump from the middle, jump, uh, I mean, jump from the uh, lower, lower income country to middle income country and the higher level income country. Yeah. But some other countries may not try. So, so, so that is the story. Yeah. Okay, so the first part, I, it's my pleasure to show you some evidence on the Chinese new quality growth. But we do see, as we said, we do see that China's, Chinese economy faces some challenge. And the point is how to handle with this challenge. And these are the five key words for the China's new economic development plan. And I say this is key, these five are the key words. It's not only because they are important for this year. No, it's not only this year. It's not only for the 14th uh, plan, say that from up to 2025. No, it's not, it's maybe, I would say these five key words will be important for China's long run economic growth, maybe up to 2050. I'm serious, maybe up to 10 So, yeah, what? so this is five guys. Uh, uh, then they will be the most important thing to understand the Chinese economy now. One by one. Mm -hmm. Let me introduce yeah. uh, one of them. The number one is called innovation. Innovation is the most important driving force of the current Chinese economy. I will show you what happened for the Chinese innovation now. Okay. okay. The first index is look at the R&D intensity. By definition, means the industry R&D input over your GDP. So this is called R&D intensity. This year, China's R&D over GDP is 2.55%. What does that mean? Well, if you think about the OECD countries level, OECD is 2.6%. So it's a more or less we are equivalent to the OECD average level. OK, that's good. But the trend thing is coming in the second part. Because you understand, say, R and D, we got two parts, right? One is called R, another one is called D, research and development. And for China's challenge is that we have a lot of uh, applications They focus on the development, but we do not have too much fundamental research input. So what I would say is that R share, R over R and D, the proportion of the R over R and D is too small. For example, well, the basic research the R and D ratio uh, is 6.55 percentage. Our objective is that up to 2025, this number will increase, increase to 7 percent. I am optimistic on that, but the point is, even doing so is not enough. Why? Because if you look at the United States, now today, this number, they are close to 10 percent. So that's why we need to increase the number. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. That's number Number two, we also have some other research on the, well, which one are the most important <laughs> innovating uh, firms in the industry? So, put this way, let me ask this way. Say, suppose you consider one industry. And then the question is that, within this industry, which firms, they are the most important firms, they have the highest in the R&D input. So, three possible answer. Number one is the, the best firms. Number two is the worst firms. Number three is the firms in the between, in the middle. So, three possible answers, which one is correct? Certainly, it's impossible to for the worst firms. Because, suppose they worst firms, which means that their productivity is the lowest. If they are worst, they are not able to survive the model. Right? How can you ask them to burn the money? Because R&D basically means you burn the money, right? So, this is not good. 
How about the best ones? Well, I admit there are some best ones that have a lot of RNG like Huawei, but it doesn't mean that all the ones have, have this clear uh, denominator in China. So you can see that on average, this is the U turn, this is the inverse U turn, right? The, this is inverse U shape, right? So basically, it means that those ones in the between in the middle have the highest RNG intensity. And why is that? This is one for the escape of competition. Because those firms in the middle, I mean, they got very strong competition. It's a net to net competition, right? And they're, and they're also those, you want to have a better call, then you need to have a more RD input. There's something like that where, uh, suppose the employment market is tough, and then you got your bachelor's degree before it was very heavy, but now because the employment market is tough, so bachelor is not good enough, you have to apply to the master, right? And then once the, you think the master, you, you figure out the master is also not very good, then you need to go to PhD. <laughs> Something like this. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, this is called the uh, inverse, inverse new shape. So, yeah, so this is also a beyond story, and, and then we, we dig out that this is with China's data, and this is also a paper with Kevin and Daniel in and Chapter in University of Toronto and the world. Okay, yeah. So, next okay. part. Okay, this is not easy. Perhaps it's about the, it's about the environment, environment, environmental protection, what we call the grid. Okay, so China is, uh, one of China, I mean, care in very much environmental protection. For example, I mean, China is a funding member of the UNFCCC, United Nations uh, Framework of the uh, Climate uh, Change. Yeah, so it's called UNFCCC in the 1997, and also the funding member of the uh, Kyoto Protocol in 2012, and also the Paris Agreement in the 2016. So that's the point. And then China also now that we, we, we share the, this idea with other countries. I think other countries work on the share the responsibility of the carbon emission. But the point is, but the point is that what are the most important ideas? This is a basic principle. Everyone agrees. But the point is how to do that, how to understand that. And then China, I mean, emphasize two key words. Number one is the carbon emission is uh, is accumulated. For example, if you look at today, this year's uh, environmental, you say environmental global, you say, well, the, the, the air condition, the air pollution is, 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 is very bad. But it doesn't mean that this is done by today, only one day. It's done by many, many years. So you need to say, well, the carbon emission is accumulated. Accumulated from when? Ideas that well, maybe it's the starting from the industrial revolution. Industrial revolution, and then we got the data say, well, say starting from the 18, 1871, I mean, once the Germany united, right? So in 1871, and then you can calculate every country's responsibility in terms of their CO2 emission. And then basically you can see that well, the United States and they are responsible is 29 percent, EU 25 percent, and then China is 9 percent, Russia 8 percent, Japan 4 percent, and respectively. So basically it's Following this quarter, every country need to pay the money. The simple way is put this way. That's number one. And number two, which means that uh, we also need to, need to consider the per capita. Because I mean, China has 1.4 billion people. And the carbon emission by 1.4 billion people certainly is different from a country or an economy with only say two, I mean, the 2 million people or 20 million people. Right? So, and the per capita index is also important. Okay, but now turning to China's domestic objective of the carbon emission, we got the objective say, in the 2030, we will reach the peak, and then the 2060, we will go to the, to the carbon neutrality. So, three years, 2030 peak, and 2060 neutrality. Uh, I mean, so what's the challenge here? The challenge say, well, because you only got 30 years from the peak to the neutrality, from 2060 minus 2030, only 30 years. Research showed that indeed it could be easier for a country if you can have 50 years, but 50 years is too long for China, so we got 30 years. Then there's another story for the policy maker they need to think, for example, particularly for the local government. They need to think, say, well, okay, now the central government want me to reach the peak in the 2030, but is it good for me to reach the peak earlier, say 2028, 20, or 
later 2017. Certainly, if you finish the task in 2028, for example, earlier than 2030, it's a good index, right? So you are not doing a good job. But the, good, but the bad thing is that where is harm for the economic growth? This way, the technology will grow more. So this is a trade that we use. But once again, the point is that the most important challenge is that the harm to solve for China to realize this uh, carbon emission uh, mission. And then because of this, let's go to see the detail. Okay, this is also important. So please look at the left hand side table. We understand, say, China has another objective. They call the non-fossil, non-fossil energy consumption have to account for 25% of the global energy in 2030. Again, non-fossil energy consumption, which means here, nuclear power, water, and also other renewable, like solar, panel solar, like uh, uh, wind, right? So I mean, that this will account for the 25% uh, 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 in the 2030, in the 2030. But if you look at more details for China, what is the situation? You can see that in the 2019, for this uh, table, this nuclear account for 2.4 China's total consumption, and then water 8%, and then the renewable is 4.7%. Adding up together this green number, we have equal to 15%. More or less, almost the same as the world average level. You can see the world average level, they got 16%. In the United States, it's almost the same thing. If you add up these guys together, well, maybe it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, 16 percent as well. So more or less it's the same. And this year, now today, this year in 2022, we got close to 18 percent. 2021 is 17.5 percent. This year is 18 percent. Okay, 18 percent. Our objective is that in the 2030 come to the 25 percent. This is a not easy task because you only got seven years left, and then you need to increase the proportion from the 18 percent to 25 percent. Okay, and then now let's go to a very another detailed uh, policy question that we need to consider. If you if you want to increase this proportion, you got two possible options. Number one option is that okay, I will reduce the chemical or or or, or the fossil energy consumption quickly. You decrease the gas, you decrease the coal, something like this, right? So that's one possibility. And then once it's done, I increase the I increase the new, I increase the renewable energy. That's the first option. But the other option is that no, I will working on the renewable energy first. Once it's done, I reduce the traditional. So which option is the best for China? We also have some lesson before. In China before, we believe that maybe we need to reduce the traditional one, and once it's done, we increase the new one. But this has some problems. Because how can you know that your renewable energy can be successful? Right? And then suppose this cannot be successful, then that you have the additional things here, you reduce these things, you reduce the supply. Your demand is there, so then there will be some problem. For example, especially in the in the winter, you do not have enough heat, that there will be a problem, right? So now yeah, so I mean now I'm the government now is very clear. You need to increase the renewable first, and once it is successful, then you decrease the transition. So yeah, that is another idea. Okay, and then I have some other research from here. It's very uh, academic, but basic story is that well, question is here we ask obviously how environmental regulation affect change. If you're following the international standard, how can your environmental regulation affect change? Two opportunity faults here. Number one is, for example, because you have to. I mean, a day for the environmental compliance cost. So this means that will increase your cost to the funds, and then this will reduce your problem. So that maybe will reduce your test. So that's bad. But the good way is that maybe because of this pressure, you will use better technology. Right? So it's called the environmental induced technology improvement. So suppose the point is that which one dominate? Suppose the second one dominate the first one. Then it will which means that the environmental regulation will first change. And this is what we find exactly from the data, from the empirical research here. Okay. So that is the, another idea. And, okay, and we also, just very recently, we have a, a project uh, is, uh, 
is I mean uh, collaborator with the CIC with Minister called the China International uh, Cooperation of the Environmental Development. Yeah, so so basically that we try to calculate how much carbon emission for the Chinese export. Once again, carbon emission for the Chinese export. Number one, we look at the scale. Suppose you say 10, every 10,000 US dollars, which industry have the highest carbon emission? And then when we try to understand this question, because we understand the global supply chain, right? For example, if you export, if you produce the iPhone, it doesn't mean that you only need an iPhone itself, you only need to put the shell itself, you also need the chip and also many other products. So what you want to say is you need to consider input output linkage. So this is why we use the WIOT, the world input and output database to calculate this precisely. And then based on this calculation, we find that number one, the top three industries take away innovation this year. The top industry will be the furniture, and then the second one with the basic metals, and then the chemical and other chemical products. Okay, that is in terms of the every ten thousand dollars, how many carbon emission, how, how many tons of carbon carbon emission, carbon emission. Yeah. And then this comes to the second part, say we also don't use you only look at the Every 10,000 tons, which industry has the, the highest one, highest one. So this industry they have uh, the most uh, carbon emission. This one for the manufacturing of the computers, the tuning, the yeah. So yeah. So okay. Then ask one more important question. Suppose you want to protect the environment, then how can we do? We say we need to reduce the traditional energy. This is fine. But can you tell me, say, in terms of the policy, tell me what if the cool price increase 10%, how much your carbon emission will reduce? And then based on the econometry, I mean estimation and also calculation, we figure out that well when the cool price goes up 10%, China's export carbon emission will decrease 1.3%. Once again, 10% will decrease 1.3%. Yeah. And, the, and the, of course, this will have a show the industrial heterogeneity. I mean, basically, you see that it's the industrial uh, heterogeneity of the industry, top industry will be the same. The same. Yeah. That is about the second idea, the green, I mean, the protected environment. And then we then come to the next part. Come to the, okay. Yeah, we come to the next part. This is what we call the uh, harmony or say the coordination. This is also another top idea for China. Basically, story is that for the Chinese government, number of objective, basically they want to have these four guys to realize these four guys. Number one is called the modern agriculture. Yeah, modern agriculture. Uh, uh, yeah, you need to have the modern agriculture as number one, but there's uh, more than this can be done from the next part. The second thing and the most important thing comes in the second part. The modern industrialization and also the modern urbanization and also the uh, modern uh, communication. Yeah, yeah, I mean, modern IT, modern communication. This regards. And then let me ask one question. For example, what is the best relationship between industrialization and urbanization? Because you see, some countries they got very high number of industrialization, but low number of urbanization. In some countries, has the opposite. But the point is that, for me, at the best way is to just to be a company, to be coordinated. Let me give you two country examples. For example, think about some countries, or say some economies, they got very high urbanization, but they do not have an industrialization. So, what's the best? So, think about the South Africa. The basic story is that, well, many people come to the city. Right, so this is called urbanization. But the point is that because they do not have the urbanization, therefore they are not able to find a job. So many people come to the city, but they are not able to find a job. What is the cause? What is the consequence? Eventually, you will have a slum, and eventually this will affect your sustainable development. So that's that. And also think about the other opposite. Say, for example, in China, you got the advanced industrialization, but you have a left behind what we call the so that's also not good as well. 
Why? Because, okay, in some area, for example, in Guangdong province or in Zhejiang province, you got a very strong labor demand. But you do not have a sufficient labor supply. So therefore, because labor demand is very strong, labor supply is weak. Therefore, your wages will increase. Once your wages increase, first of all, will decrease. And therefore, the government cannot be sustainable, and also the local government cannot have too much tax revenue. Yeah. So, because of this, I mean, we need to keep these two guys I mean, in the same place. And because of this, what happened for China now today? Well, we now we're trying to increase our urbanization. And if you look at this light, light, light that he was restoring, well, once I mean the light, I mean the area is a very light, and we use that, it's a good quality light, because at night you have to use that. <laughs> At night, you need to use the light, right? So, which means we also have they are very strong, which means it's good economy. So, in China, I mean, several areas are good. Number one, this is called the Yangtze River Delta. Yangtze River Delta, in Shanghai is here. And this is called the GBA, good and greater Bay Area. So, basically, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and then in Guangdong, and then here, right? So, these two guys are good. This is the capital area, Beijing and Tianjin, capital area. And this is this number three. Number four, Chengdu and Chongqing area. They are they about another mega cities. And number five, this is called the Shenzhou Changjiang, Shenzhou Yangtze River Delta. So this is called the Wuhan, and this is the Chinese side, and this is the China. So basically, I mean, that is what we're trying to do as organization. So this is called the first tier of organization. But so, if you come to this map, basically it's one, two, three, four, five, this is the first tier. But then also the second tier, and then for example, Shenyang is here, uh, Shenyang in Dalian. So basically, this is called uh, the central, central and South Liaoning organizations. And then you also see that the other area. So now today, it doesn't mean that the first tier organization must be better than the second tier. No, now it's very competitive. The policy is there. I mean, your local government, if you have a uh, you, if you have a good policy, if you have a good way, then you do the, you, you do the best. So the second tier doesn't mean that they are, they are worse than the uh, first tier. Okay, so basically. And then, now a very interesting story. What is the relationship between urbanization and the infrastructure? So look at this map. This is the China's booty chain, fast booty chain. The fast booty chain. So basically, you see a look, I mean, this is the vertical one, one, two, three, and the horizontal, two, right? And then you can see the need, I mean the nexus, I mean the integration here, basically it's the organization area. From the econometric perspective, it's very difficult to say which one is the cause, which one is the, uh, the, the result. But basically it's highly correlated, highly, highly correlated. So this is the booty chain. Now let me also show you some highway, highway construction. So this is my paper from the I, the Bureau of International Economics, and you see here. So basically, you can see that it's a highway system in the year 2000. We can get a highway system in the year 2000 and a highway system in 2005 before the financial crisis. So it's very obvious. You will see that in the year 2000, when China asset to put up UK, okay, too much higher, right? But in 2005, this is still 15 years ago, you can see a lot. Yeah. So we will say it's infrastructure. So the basic information is that infrastructure help and foster economic growth. OK. okay. So now let's come to the, the number four, what we call the concern that is also very important for China's uh, new economic reform. So three things we need to consider. Number one is called public deduction. Second one is called uh, uh, rural revitalization. And the uh, last one called the neutral prosperity. Let me introduce one by one. Number one, public deduction. To me, I mean, this is the seven China's minor. The first China miracle is that it is that everyone knows that. But he here the said one, many, not many one knows this. Why is that? Think about this matter. In year 2015, we still got 55 million people, once again, 55 million people under poverty in the 2015. But now they all go. They all go. Although I mean the number, I mean the poverty number, I mean the, the, the standard I mean the standard is here. Uh, the mean is uh, 2300 per capita year. I mean per capita year, 2300 divided by seven would be something like six. Uh, no, no, I mean divided by seven uh, would be something like a, a, a three to four, three to three hundred to four hundred per capita per year. So that's taken. If your if your income per person is higher than this number, you are under you are out of the poverty. Yeah. So
some, some, some stories here. And then you can see this, what's important property line here. What we need here. You can see that the horizontal part is China's per capita income. Then this is the uh, property resource. You can see, for example, before $5,000 uh, per year GDP per capita, it's very steep, right? And why is that? Because it, at that moment, it's easy to reduce the poverty. Basic story is that well, once you got the industrialization, once the guys got the job, well, they will send the money back to the, the rural area. And therefore, I mean, it's easy to get the, get the poverty out of the poverty. So basically, at that moment, you got a very clear relationship between the economic development and the poverty reduction. But that was in the early stage. Later on, it's not the case. Well, they told us, suppose you got the economic development. Your pie, your economic pie is bigger and bigger. But it doesn't mean that you got a better reallocation. Maybe your Gini coefficient is even larger. But right? so it's not that simple. Therefore, you see, it's very difficult to remove the, those I mean, small numbers. And that was another achievement for China. And then if you ask me, suppose you ask, suppose you, if you want to ask me why China can do that, I think a very obvious but also very important answer is that because China got a very strong government. And this is really important. Yeah. If you think about it, a government, especially the central government, is is important, is no power, then its policy cannot cannot apply everywhere. But now because China got a very strong government, then every policy can go to the bottom, can go to the very deep, to the to the rural, to the to the and so every bit can get the economy. That's the economy. Okay, so this is about poverty. And then for the, okay, so the second one. We now, we are successful on the poverty reduction, but it doesn't mean that this is the complete story. Well, what if next year those people have already outgrown poverty, they move back to the poverty, how to do it, right? So for this part, basically what we need is we work for the, uh, how to guarantee the rural way by privatization. Our suggestion is that, well, we need to have the industrial development. Because ideas is better to give people, better to tell people how to fish the important thing than to give them fish, right? <laughs> so so, so basic, basic story is that, well, look at this, this part. You can look at this area. These are also, these are all China's persistent zones, persistent export zones. Basically, story is that, well, China's industrialization focus on the eastern coast. Okay. But another challenge is that China's labor cost is increasing over here. Just now, I said optimistic ways, you compare to the United States, we are still have compared advantage. But that is because you compare to the US. What if you compare to Bangladesh, compare to Vietnam, right? Compare to Cambodia. Then basically the story is that our labor cost much, much higher than them. Although our productivity also higher than them, but we do not have comparative advantage from test by economies. So sooner or later, the labor intensive industry, like the test by economies, must move from China to other areas. Although we are not sure whether it's to the East Asia or to the African. I mean, to me, I would say the Africa will be the final destination. Because labor, I, I went to Ethiopia in, in 2014. And the story is that I went to the factory. You know, the labor cost in China at the moment, 2014, labor cost in China in Dongwa will be 40 to 100 ZMB per month, which means that compared to the US dollar, will be 600 US dollar per month for the labor, for the work. Can you guess how high of the, in the Ethiopia? It's only in terms of ZMB, 260, 260 per month. In China, we got 40 to 100. Yeah, so less than one tenth, less than one tenth. Although our productivity is twice higher than them, but our labor cost is 10 times higher than them. How can we do that? Right? So that's the point. So what we're saying is the labor cost increases, and therefore the labor intensity has to move to the other countries. Yeah. Doesn't matter if we like or not. Yeah. And then that's number one. But on the other hand, we say the capital intensive industry can still rely on China. Why is that? Because for the capital intensive industry, the most important input cost is not your labor. But whether you have a complete industrialization, you, if you have a complete industry, right? and that is the advantage of the Chinese economy, and therefore we say that the capital intensive industry can stay there. 
I also have a case study here, again, in Ethiopia. I went to the park in the Ethiopia and I observed two things. One is the labor intensive that they are working with shoes, but maybe another one they are working on the longer cycle. Uh, they also go to China. And the longer cycle industry was unsuccessful. Why is that? For example, think about this way. If your energy, if your energy power doesn't work right, then how can you go? I mean, certainly Ethiopia cannot produce that. You need to import from Chongqing, uh, China again, and think about the uh, labor cost and the transportation cost and so on. Certainly they don't have the money to learn. Yeah. So 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 put this way, I mean they say we say they cable intensive industry still can be maintained in China. And because of this, well, because you, if you look at China's central and western area, these areas they got complete industrial uh, classification. So basically, if this industry move to the central and to the west, we will help the area in the central and the west to increase the economic uh, diversity, and the poor people also live in this area. And basically, this will help you to increase the rural, the rural revitalization. But that's a story. And then, okay, so now let's move to, because we still have one more, so let me, pass, yeah, let me cut to the last one, the open cup. This is also very important. China's, as we say, the open cup, I mean, China is the largest trading country in the world. So last year, six trillion US dollars. And um, uh, in terms of the uh, surplus, also a lot, I mean, uh, this year, last year is, uh, 5 trillion zenminbi, uh, I mean, certainly, 5 trillion zenminbi, and then convert to US dollar and divide by 7. Uh, this year, maybe it will be 5.5 trillion zenminbi. Yeah, 5.5 trillion zenminbi. So, so this is about the trade. And then think about what are the most important trading part of China. Before it was very little, EU and US, if you're talking about a, a single country, then the US will be the most important. Uh, trading party, like you're talking about everything, you will be high, right? But that was before. Now, I mean, uh, since two years ago, Asian country, Asian country has already replaced that. And ASEA, Asian country has already replaced that. So it means that because, why is that? Because the RCEP, regional comprehensive economic partnership. Yeah, and then my point is that, indeed, I mean, since two years uh, on, and then the Asian will replace these two guys as the top trading partner of China. The ASEAN, EU, and US, and then South Korea, and then Japan, and then China, Taiwan, Robins, and then Hong Kong, and then Australia, Russia, and you. And indeed, I mean, Kazakhstan also have a, a very high proportion. Now, I, I guess this year, even higher than Russia. Even higher, even higher than Russia. Or almost the same. Okay, so, so this is the, so this is the uh, trade picture. I, okay. Let me show you some interesting research result here. Okay, okay, yeah. So this one. We have one paper just uh, uh, just forthcoming the instead we do before statistics. So basically it's a we're talking about China and the US trade war. And the Trump administration blamed China and said, well, because you got a lot of trade surplus and therefore we need to uh, fight that. Certainly I mean, from the rest of the certainly this is this is very incomplete story because every country can gain from by other means, every people can gain from the future. So, I mean, some people will lose, some people will gain, but uh, overall, I mean, uh, you, you will have a gain. But what I want to say here, the story is that although we got, we got commodity trade surplus from the US, but on the survey chain, we got deficit. And the idea is that many Chinese families, they send their students to the United States to start the bachelor and especially for the bachelor, if you go to the Wisconsin, if you go to Berkeley, every foreign student are all Chinese. <laughs> so basically, it means that I mean they pay a lot of tuition fees. So what we find in the story is that well, the recent trade war could cost the U.S. university around 1.15 billion US dollars. Idea is that because you got a trade war and then they mean they also bar the door, and then the students cannot go to the university to start. And therefore, they lost the money. Okay, they lost money. Accounting was 3% of American education service export. And uh, very happy to see that this research is well received by, for example, by many US media, like Harvard and also by the uh, US News and something like this. Yeah. So, so that's another one. Another going, ongoing work, because I got a new PP, but it's not uh, replaced here, but otherwise, we replaced here. Yeah. 
So the unit is not in the So basically, is that, well, you see the proportional change the input value. So basically, we have another paper trying to cover the China UI chain move. Idea is that, the story is that, you know, when China export quota for the US bank, Trump administration uh, has uh, tariff, right? Very high tariff. And the retaliation side, China also has high tariff against the US. And many US economists, they work on the American side because I'm in China, so I work on the China side. <laughs> so basically, basically, what I want to see is that, well, when China has its retaliation tariff, how does this affect China in the US? And then this is a story. For example, you see, uh, we got three weeks to fight back on the US when the uh, Trump administration got the, the first wave of the 50 billion in China has the 50 billion back, right? And then the second wave too, they got they got 200 billion. And then China government said, well, 60 billion. And then the last one, the, another 35 billion, because everyone together with China's total export, total China, China's total import from, from the United States. And then we can see that certainly this one is worse, I mean, retaliation. The import from the United States decreased the basic increase in the okay. And then we have some very uh, rich empirical estimation. I'm not showing here, but just example the result. Example the result. What do we find here? So basically, the question is this question is what's the impact of the China's retaliation tariff against the United States? Very simple and also very straightforward for the import. Once you've got the tariff, of course, import. So the import from the US degree. But we call we find a call incomplete pass through for the for example. What, do, what does that mean? Think about the story. Say this product, production will be ten dollars and nine, and then how suppose the China imposed one dollar. Then when this product goes to China, it will be ten plus what? Eleven, right? Eleven dollars. But the point is because this incomplete pass through, the the American companies, the American companies knew about this and they try to uh, try to mitigate this negative effect and therefore they lower their price. They not sell this price from ten dollars, only nine point seven dollars, for example. So nine point seven plus one is equal to ten point seven. Yeah. So ten point seven compared to the uh, uh, to the ten well divided by nine ten point seven minus ten divided by <laughs> divided by ten will be equal to seventy percent pass through. So it's not hundred percent pass through okay, so you know, on the new here. And so, why is that? Because the firms modify the free trade more important that uh, basically to mitigate the rise of trade costs. That's number one. Number two, but this is not a complete story of the trade war. Then, because the import also affects the export, because the import and export need to rise. So, I mean, the export, China's export also decreased. Export to US, export to the rest of the world all decreased the negative impact on the export. And we also got the negative depletion effect on the uh, industrial heterogeneity, we find that we have a stronger negative impact of firms with downstream export and also longer product length. So basically, this is talking about the story of the global supply chain. Of the global supply chain. Yeah. So, okay. And then, I mean, let's talk about the, let's talk about policy here for the China's all opening up, all now opening up. Basically, now I mean, the China's all now opening up now today. Number one, because of the anti-globalization. So basically now China try to diversify its export destination. Before the most important destination will be the United States and the EU. But now because the because the relationship between the EU and the and the US is a little bit complicated. So now I mean basically I mean we try to diversify the export to the new emerging economy, especially to the uh, BRICS. Yeah, and also many other emerging countries, and particularly from the ASEAN and the ASEAN countries. And then you can see a lot of research interest here, because basically it just sell the most powerful and high quality product to the EU and the US, because competition there will be tough, right? Yeah, but then you will export the fair uh, product of quality to uh, the Myanmar or something like the other countries as well, the uh, emerging countries, so that's number one. But that's not a complete story. The second one is we also try to import the, increase the import scale of the scope. So I mean China now today we do not need a lot of trade circle. Because now I mean the the the, the foreign reserve in China is more than three trillion US dollars. Once again, three trillion US dollars. It doesn't mean that once your foreign reserve is higher, you are better. In the end, it's not the case because some 
comes to your other input, put a input, input, induced inflation. Yeah, so basic story is put this way. Many people uh, just put wire there. Why I mean the surplus, two high surplus in one group. Number one, for example, because you got a surplus, and the surplus is in the US dollar, but you cannot put the US dollar into the board, right? You need to use this US dollar to eat, to invest. Then ask the same question. What do you think? Where is the most attractive place to invest? Well, I once I attend a conference, and then the discussion say whether we could go to China to invest. And then some people suddenly turn back, and then I heard about one of my panelists, and he's really cool. He said, well, for the theorists, with, for the economists, you always discuss, so many people go to China to invest. But for the firms, for the employers, once they go to invest in China, they will ask the, the second question, why not invest more? <laughs> so, so the story is that, I mean, for me, or maybe for other people, hopefully for you as well, the most easy place for the money is in China. So, so if you believe so, then, I mean, for the US dollar, it's very it's a dilemma. Because, I mean, Chinese funds got the US dollar, and then they are not able to invest in China, right? You need to invest in the, in the other countries. And then if you like that, you call them second best. Second best is a very polite answer. I told me it's the second, second worst. <laughs> because not the first best, so it's, a, so it's called the second best. Anyway, well, what I want to say, you see many FDI for China. They, Chinese firms, they invest in Hong Kong and Macau. Why is that? Well, because they, they want to invest in Macau and Hong Kong and then they, they invest back in mainland China. And because it's easy to earn the Chinese money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is the story. And then because of this, we say, well, suppose we, I mean, for the firm, if they got too high, too high service, maybe it's not good for themselves. If you do not have, then they will grow up, but too high is also not very good. That's number one. Number two is what we call the importing induced inflation. What do I mean? Think about the real story. We got uh, 300 billion. 300 billion US dollar trade surplus. Once again, 300 billion US uh, uh, dollar surplus per year. So this 300 billion, according to the policy, the firms need to uh, convert the head of the money to the community, to the government. So it's 150 uh, billion. 150 billion you sell to the central bank. And then, well, the central bank will take the Zemi P, right? Because they don't call money. And then the exchange rate say, we do not say 7.3, we say 6.5, easy to calculate. Then 150 billion times 6 consumption, say equal to the 10,000 10, uh, 10, uh, uh, billion. Yeah, yeah, so one. So, <laughs> so we will be, we will be young. So let me, let me, uh, let me slow down. So once again, you we got how? So we got uh, uh, one fifty billion times six will be equal to the thousand billion. Yeah, thousand billion. So thousand billion uh, local government uh, come to the market. And then suppose the monetary multiplier is equal to five. Yeah, yeah, four or five. Yeah, put this way because we got twenty percent. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, something like this. And then we yeah, then there will be the. Uh, uh, how much? So five trillion. Like, yeah, so we have five trillion. Yeah, actually five trillion. Mm -hmm. And then think about how high for the uh, Chinese uh, GDP is all at the moment is only one country. So, so which means that we have that. That means that. Right. And then you have, yeah, and then you M two is two times. So it's uh, five divided by two hundred will be equal to two point five percent. Which means that suppose you do not do anything, your if your according to this relation will be two point five percent. And say you say. You ask me, say, why did I see this? Why didn't I see this happen? Because we got the stabilization, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, that, that. But otherwise, we will see this inflation. So, so what I would say, that China do not want to keep very high surplus. And then another good way, if you want to do so, another way, they, they will import more, right? They will import more. So we got the, we say we only increase the imports, and they will end the store. And why import is good? Number one, suppose, think about for the, for the consumers. If you import more, you got more varieties, right? And then your consumer service will be higher uh, in balance rate. But if you want to balance, if you import intermediate input, which means that safer, safe, uh, you have more safety. If your tariff decreases, input tariff decreases, which means you import less 
Mani O people, and then Jose people, and then good people for the world. Of course, if, if we're talking about the info of the final product, yes, the competition between your friend and other friend. But in the end, some local activity guy will die, and then the slow activity guy survive, and then overall, the, the, the average, yeah, in that, the, the average productivity increase over here. So it's also good as well. Now let's move to the, uh, yeah, survey trade. Survey trade for China is not that good so far. We got the total number is number two in the world, certainly. And then the number is about 800 billion US dollars this year. 800 to 900 billion billion US dollars this year. But compared to the US, they, they have a one, uh, they have a certain, certain, uh, 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 so we got how, uh, if they got a, uh, so, so I think, so what, they, they got a 1,300 billion uh, US dollars. So basically, which means that for well, the service chain is still need to increase our scale. Yeah, in particular, we need to focus on some particular area, for example, the transportation, the tourism, and also the education. Yeah, so this is for the service chain. And then we also need to find our competitive advantage uh, industry. Because for example, my career, and career is doing a very good job in the service chain, but I'm better than, better than China, so we need to learn from the scale. So number four is the deepening the our FBI. China's our FBI in terms of the uh, flow and also in terms of the stock is already number two or number three in the world. So basically the US, Japan, and China. Some of the is US, China, and Japan. Yeah. So basically this is for it. But for our FBI, what I want to say is that number one, well, for the so the scale is not global. But the point is for the Chinese firms, they maybe they can have a more social responsibility in the hosting country. For example, if we are basically you know, the more social responsibility, for example, if for the Chinese firm, they, they, they spend some money on the schools or, the, or something like that, then people will like it very much. Right? So this is called this is what called the this is what called the uh, social responsibility. And then certainly uh, why Chinese firms go out for invest. Basically, sometimes you will go out for invest is for the uh, because you want to save your labor cost, like Ethiopia. Uh, maybe sometimes because you want to market, suppose you go to the South America and what of other places. Maybe you want to have a better technology if you go to the US and they do something like that. Yeah. So I mean, but that doesn't matter. I mean, the firms by firms can 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 have the contact with me. One more one is too important. So my key point is that. Suppose now that if you look at the whole map, because I do not have the update TV, otherwise you can see the map. Now the whole world is uh, separated by three trading blocks. Number one is the US MCA, first US is the hub. And the second one is the EU, Germany is the hub. And then with the RCP area, China is the hub. And then we see the three world order, uh, 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 triangle map they have. But that means the triangle they are separated from then they are separated completely. Indeed, they try to be connected together. For example, think about the US MCA and also the, uh, the EU. Basically, they try to have a uh, bilateral trade agreement for the TTIP there. And then the EU in China now we're talking about the China and the EU CAI, uh, Comprehensive Agreement for Investment. And then the RCB and the US MCA and they have a CPTPP uh, negotiating there. So basically, this is the whole story. But you see that some countries are not there. And there is many different countries from the from Asia, from uh, Africa and Latin America. That is the essential idea of the one day one day. And to me, I think that for China, we should have a tool, I mean what uh, to promote the one day one day. Uh, maybe we got different uh, focus on the land load and the marine load. For the land load, so basically the story is that uh, number one, increase the Cooperation between China and the Central Asian country, particularly, uh, I mean, Kazakhstan, yeah? So that's number one, this is really important. Yeah, and on the other way, increase the cooperation between China and the Russian on the Far East area, Far East area, that's another one. And that is for the uh, land law. For the marine law, I do not think that the focus should be going to the South as well, because we have already done RCP. I think that the most important way for China's policy is we need to consider CJK agreement, China, Korea, and Japan FTA. Yeah, because I mean, as we show here, you can see, you can see China and you can see that I mean, Korea and Japan they are most they are two very so they are two very important. Oh, yeah. 
Yes, you can see uh, Korea and Japan, they are very two important trading partners in China. So basically, we need to increase the sea trade. And it's not only good for China, but certainly also very good for Korea and Japan. Of course, from the uh, political perspective, it's not easy to do that. But maybe we can see that we can do out the China and Japan FTA. Yeah, because we, we have already got China and Korea FTA. So maybe China and Japan FTA is better. So that's on the one, one thing I want to make, also reasonable operation. So, uh, time is short, so let me stop here, let me give me one, we have another research, but let me uh, put this way. So, okay, so this is RCP area. So basically, you see the, you see the black. Well, uh, for the RCP, uh, so you see why RCP is important for China. Because before, I mean, China don't have any international cooperation agreement with Japan. Now with RCP we do have. Of course, I mean this one compared to the just one I mean to the C they can agree, I mean this still a very meaningful level is to need to like, push up into higher level. But more or less this is why RCP is important for China and also many uh yeah, countries as well. Okay, so let me wrap up <laughs> the story. We say China has already overcome the condition, the challenge of the pandemic and now we have moved the uh, economic development to the I speed for the high quality growth, and then we need to uh, follow with the new development here. And yeah, and the dual situation means that only one way we try to open it up, and on the other way we will uh, form our enlarged uh, domestic united market. So the domestic market, united market is also very important for China. And then certainly you can find some some of my research on my these findings. <laughs> they are all in English. So yeah, so for example, the first one is uh, the overall uh, openness, and the second one is the China your trade war in trade war. They are very happy with this war. This book indeed is a uh, global learning book, <laughs> because maybe it's because of the topic. Yeah, and this is about the uh, uh, FDI in trade and credit and trade and in the international trade. This is an introduction about the China's uh, foreign trade. This is the, this, this is about China's FDI, our FDI. Yeah, in total. Yeah. So let me stop here, and then thank you so very much. If you have any questions for Professor Yu, please feel free to raise them. We have another uh, seven minutes before the next class starts. So you have five minutes to go. Please uh, keep your questions brief and to the point. about Chinese population, uh, according to forecast in 2060, uh, the Chinese population will drop for 400 million, and it's going to be below uh, 1 million. Uh, so what do you think about uh, this forecast, and how it's going to affect the world trade and the Chinese economy in this world? Thank you. So, yeah, sorry, so for the of the Chinese population, right? the Chinese now it's about uh, 1.4 billion, and in four years it's gonna be below 1 billion. So it's okay. yeah. gonna affect uh, the you. China economy and the world economy as well. Yeah, yeah, I got the point. Yeah. So this is a really important question. As I got to mention at the very beginning, Asian property is also a challenge for China. So I mean, we see many more and more people, they do and do that. Now, I mean, this year, China's average uh, man's life is 79 years old. Yeah, and then you can see that the uh, dependency ratio, which means that the, uh, the, the older people and the younger people, they also increase more in this. So, yeah, yeah. it's what uh, I wanted to say. Like, uh, the, we will kind of face the, like, the stagnation as Japan yeah, yeah. facing now. Yeah, so let me, uh, let me speak yeah, uh, and uh, the answer. So, in because this, China also has this uh, old ways to handle this problem. So, basically, it's number one. We, we are considered to increase the working age, which means that uh, hopeful the retirement age. So for example, now the official will be 60, and then later will be 65, something like, something like this. It's another two. We will be increased the uh, only job training. So basically say, well, suppose you will not have many people, but they suppose you cannot be trained to be increased more in the area is more important. So the education will be more and more important for China for China this year. And this is not only in the I mean, international policy, but in the most in, um, in our own, in our own and that's 
because we are able to do so, I, I do not think that this is a defense for the standard of the one. Because why is that? Because we uh, we will say this is a global challenge, not the China, not a China specific challenge. And so that is what uh, I certainly do. Any other questions? Please, could you come close to the mic? So it's, a, so it's a very good point. Yeah. So let me I just now make a few things up. We say the key point is a draw a lot I mean how to how to consider shared responsibility like for the environmental. Yes. So so the point is, I mean this is very this is not an easy story, but this is not an easy answer for this uh, for this uh, problem. But it's a very difficult issue. For example, my point is that when we think about this story, now I mean the EU has what we call the uh, deformist yeah, uh, 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 policy. Certainly, this is a this is a good uh, uh, idea, but the point is let let me think of, let me think about it from the perspective from the different country. They must say, for example, think about say the, the soybean from uh, uh, from Brazil. Then they were saying, well, environmental protection is important, but the point is, well, maybe the development rights are important, but maybe this is too broad. Let let's uh, put this perspective. They say, look, yes, I produce the food, right? But the point is, you use that. The consumer use that. If you do not use that, if you do not buy that, I will not produce. Yeah, so I mean, basically say, well, so you need to buy the food. Because, because you, you, you use that for the ideas that the consumer has a say. But if on the consumer side says, no, the producer side has a say. Why? Because I already pay you the money. And I also help you create the job, right? So I mean, this is the debate between the production, the producers, and the consumers. So I think the most important thing is how to solve a lot between the producers and the, and the consumers. This is a 50-50, or this is a 60-40, and the 30 in sense. But I think for the countries, for the states, the most important thing is how to solve a lot. When you say it's a 50-50, when you say it's a 40-60, or 70-30, what is the rationale? What is the rationale? Right. So that is what we will see. And I think at this moment, maybe it's the best thing is let the economy to answer the question. For example, if you think about, I mean, well, this will be, we are depending on if your economy size, we are depending on industry and so on. So I think for the government, because when we talk about the green, certainly this is the principle, everyone agrees, right? But the point is then how to draw a line to the dimension, the state. So that's my thought. So I guess the answer is who will bear the burden of the cost of environmental improvement? Will it be the consumers or the producers? Or sharing with the two. Thank you. Any other questions? So yeah. folks, thank you for coming. And thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you.